Good morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. And we are considering testimony on two bills regarding criminal threatening, H203 and H302. And we're going to start with our Washington County State's Attorney. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. For the record, I'm Roy Kiba, Washington County State's Attorney. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with the committee this morning. As a Washington County State's Attorney, unfortunately, uh, I'm often called upon to review cases that involve threats to either state government employees or to legislators, uh, particularly when uh, you are collected in person, at least, in uh, Montpelier. Uh, with that said, um, I think Bryn did an excellent job uh, outlining the true threats doctrine and some of the impediments that exist to um, proving a criminal threatening case and uh, why there could be frustration. In context, uh, a lot of things that are disturbing to the recipient of a message or what appears to be a threat doesn't constitute a legal or cognizable criminal action for a threat. So for example, in recent history, we've had threats made against state government employees, uh, including very senior members of the state government that are ambiguous, something like, I hope you die, or I hope you rot in hell. Uh, in other contexts or the other portions of the message that can be incredibly disturbing and really create fear. However, under current, uh, not just Vermont law, but really the Supreme Court law about what true threats entail, um, that is still uh, within the realm of constitutionally protected uh, speech. So there's the difficulty. And I don't subscribe to the notion that just because someone's in public service, they have to have a higher tolerance for uh, these um, invasions uh, into um, one's peace and security. Uh, I think Representative Burdett made an excellent point, which is in asking is criminal threatening, criminal threatening. I think the short answer to that is, is yes. Uh, the standard is the same whether someone is in public service or not presently. Uh, that said, there, the impact of those type of threats or actions directed towards someone are no less terrifying for one of our friends or neighbors who's not in elected service. Uh, but I think Representative Rachelson's correct that at, there comes a point in time where these threats directed towards elected officials do deter free thinking and decision making and can actually bully people from expressing their true views or even lead to departure from, uh, from public service, which is um, not a good thing. A few things I wanted to talk about structurally when uh, I think the conversation today was outstanding in terms of identifying uh, the pros and cons of identifying additional classes of, of people. I want to just highlight for the committee some other areas where there are already definitions that outline elected officials uh, for cross-reference. So first, 13 BSA uh, 3006 deals with neglect by public officials. And it's a pretty comprehensive definition, uh, I think, to the point of Representative Knott would cover uh, even those at a local uh, level. So section 3006 covers state, county, town, village, fire district, school district officers. Uh, so really, that's all focused on the executive branch. But that is one definition that goes a little bit beyond um, just elected officials itself. Additionally, 13 BSA 1028, as many of you may be familiar with, enhances uh, punishment for simple assault and some other crimes with respect to the term perfect, protected professionals. Protected professionals include law enforcement officers, firefighters, healthcare workers, DCF employees, and EMS personnel. So really uh, your line of first responders along with uh, DCF. From a structural standpoint, I also wanna note that uh, we have not, we've discussed this in the context of criminal threatening. It's also important to recognize that 13 BSA 1027 also outlines uh, disturbing the peace by electronic means or disturbing the peace by phone. Frequently, the uh, threats or um, items received by legislators or others who are threatened come by text message, social media, phone calls, uh, and are not just, a, are not a face to face threat. Threshold for disturbing the peace by electronic means uh, is a little bit lower than criminal threatening. It doesn't require the state to demonstrate that the uh, individual was actually a reasonable individual would suffer you know, fear of, of a substantial bodily injury. Um, also, another distinction as well, disturbing the peace by electronic means uh, right now does include, um, I'll try to read this for you. It does not currently include threats to a family member. However, it does include threats of injury or physical harm to the person or the property of any person. So it goes broader than just protecting the person. Criminal threatening right now is limited to the, the person. I agree with, um, and I might be dancing into the uh, discussion of 302, but I agree with uh, Bryn Harris' discussion that the uh, definition of family member should be this 
Title 15 definition of family or household member is that's much more relevant, I think, applicable to uh, circumstances where there's not a, a direct uh, blood lineage or a marriage, uh, yet it's still someone who's part of that uh, individual's household. Um, I think it's also worth at the threshold just talking about the responses. And so uh, I was very pleased uh, last year to be part of a conversation uh, with Coach Christie in the Social Equity Caucus. Uh, State's Attorney Martha and I were able to talk about hate crime enhancement and some of the impediments to proving a hate crime. The True Threats Doctrine uh, overlaps there as well and some of the same limitations or frustrations that are faced by law enforcement and prosecutors are applicable here. With that in mind, the structure of the two offenses we deal with without an enhancement right now, disturbing the peace by electronic means is punishable by a maximum of three months of incarceration. Criminal threatening is, uh, can be punished by up to one year of incarceration. Both are offenses that qualify for presumptive diversion uh, under um, 3 VSA section 163. Both are non-listed and neither carries any sort of Brady disqualification. As uh, non-listed misdemeanors, they are the type of cases where, uh, you know, in for our, na our neighbors who are not in, in this type of position, they are typically considered for diversion or the Tamarack program and sent that way, sometimes without conditions of release being imposed. Seldom do these cases result in a flash citation or an emergency arrest of someone coming in. Um, likewise, uh, they're there are offenses that qualify for a maximum under current law of $200 bail, and then uh, the conditions of release, of course, would be fairly minimal, typically tailored towards protecting an individual or restricting movement of the person to a place or, or household. So in that sense, it's important to note that an enhancement builds upon a relatively low uh, threshold of offenses. And I'm not here today to propose that there should be some sort of radical increase of these to, to cover those, but I want to give away the land uh, of what the actual consequence can be. Um, I know this committee has spent a great deal of time talking and considering, and I'm sure Marshall uh, from the Defender General's office will have comments on this as well. There's been um, been a lot of, I, I guess, debate and discussion about the effectiveness of an enhancement as a means of de deterring behavior. What I think is important to note is, as I note, you know, the maximum punishments here are relatively low. So if nothing else, an enhancement provides a longer opportunity for supervision. Um, I'd be hard pressed to find a, a circumstance where anyone has received uh, a maximum incarcerative sentence or a straight to serve of one year in criminal threatening at this point. Um, but that does come into play in terms of the Department of Corrections supervision. As misdemeanor offenses, both uh, for, under Title 28, both are misdemeanors that qualify or without, without the court deviating upward, they would only qualify for two years of probationary supervision. And of course, in a two serve setting, that would give you a maximum of either three months or one year uh, supervision. So with that, with that said, um, the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriff in my office are not going to take a position on whether or not there should be an enhancement or what groups should be protected. That is a question of policy for the legislature to decide. And I think there've been valid points raised to, to both ends. So, um, you know, there is, there is the friction of when these threats are directed towards people just trying to do their jobs to make state government function, whether executive or legislative or even judicial branch, uh, versus, uh, you know, friends and neighbors who are just trying to go about their lives. The, the, the terror and impact is often the same from this. One thing I would recommend that the committee uh, study further, and I want to note, is that when we look at um, both the executive branch and the judicial branch, we have offenses that are geared uh, towards holding individuals criminally liable when their actions impact executive or judicial operations, specifically uh, obstruction of justice under 13 BSA 3015. Someone can be held liable at up to five years as a felony offense for endeavoring to impede the due administration of justice. That's typically by trying to influence what witnesses say, intimidate a judicial officer. Uh, I'll allow all of you to you know, catch up and read that in, in your spare time. Uh, but there are a number of specific circumstances where uh, there can be a impact on the judicial system, and that has been noted. Likewise, um, Section 3001 of Title 13 deals with uh, hindering or, the term is used sort of interchangeably, hindering or impeding a law enforcement officer. So that's, again, a civil or military or a law enforcement officer executing uh, the laws of the state of Vermont uh, who is interfered with in some manner by um, by a member of the public or another individual. So the legislature has identified uh, through existing statute areas in which uh, we hold people criminally liable 
not necessarily for directly threatening, but rather conduct or combination of conduct and words that tends to impact the ability of executive or judicial officers to do their job or accomplish their statutory missions. Uh, I was not able to find an analogous um, law dealing with that with respect to the legislature. So as an alternative to enhancement, the, the committee may want to consider whether there are there is language or other options to take a look at the circumstances where uh, words or actions um, are unduly impeding or intimidating a legislator from uh, effectuating his or her duties. With respect to H302, um, a few things I wanted to note. Right now, uh, under, uh, I mentioned before, under A2, this is line 19 of what's in front of you, I agree with, um, with Bree's comment that it should reference family or household members, and that definition is found under Title uh, 15. It's also relied upon for our domestic assault um, offenses. Turning to the more uh, substantive changes on page two, starting on line seven, uh, one concern, or I guess one comment I had is, I, I do believe that there is a need to have enhanced protection for schools. The question though becomes, as the language is written right now, it is limited to threaten to use a firearm or explosive device in a school building on school grounds or an institution of higher education. It doesn't make credit or acknowledge against a population identified as part of one of those organizations. And if you go back to page one, criminal threatening as it stands right now is threaten any person. There may be certain times where we are unable to identify a specific person, rather the threat is generic towards, I'm going to shoot up a classroom or you know, the high school located at X or, or something along those lines. And certainly uh, in recent history, we've of course seen what happened in Fairhaven and uh, more recently even than Fairhaven, um, about just over two years ago now, uh, the Harvard Union High School had a uh, threat from a staff member. Um, I think it's important to note and credit that this is a little bit different than typical criminal threatening because that threat caused uh, mass fear and concern among a large group, both parents and students. Uh, in speaking with, at the time, the superintendent of, of the, of the, uh, the representative grad might be able to correct me. I know it changed after Act 46. I think it's the Washington West Unified Union uh, Supervisory District. Yeah, no, it's not um, union, but yeah, super. Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, in any event, the superintendent uh, indicated a just staggering increase in the number of students who called out and stayed out, not just for one day, but for, in some cases, up to a week. It also triggered a large scale uh, Vermont State Police and then sheriff response uh, providing security there. So this did not come without impact on the lives of a broad group of people and also a fiscal impact on the school district having to retain uh, security in that sense. So I'd encourage the committee to consider whether there's some way to capture um, a group of people associated with the school, not just the building infrastructure or grounds itself. Uh, finally, my last comment for uh, this morning uh, will be, uh, I agree that the striking of the affirmative defense under subpart F starting at line 18 on page uh, two is appropriate. Uh, I think that the affirmative defense is something that's difficult for uh, the state to deal with or disprove. Uh, understanding or appreciating at the time of charging uh, whether someone did or did not have the ability to um, effectuate this is difficult uh, without more intrusive means of executing a search warrant, looking for guns, looking for other you know things that may not be feasible or practical given the, the time considerations or distance between the person making the threat and, and the nature of the threat. Uh, generally speaking, Vermont law does not have many affirmative defenses uh, in statute. That said, I, I'll defer. I, I might, Jim Marshall may have some comments on this. Uh, we had a great sentencing commission meeting on Monday where uh, the idea of whether uh, ag basically discussing aggravating or mitig mitigating factors embedded in statute and uh, some uh, potentially unfavorable case law on that. But I think he'd be more eloquent in, in describing the um, risk factors associated with those mitigating, with having a statutorily based mitigating factor. That said, it certainly is something that should be credited, and I think even absent the statute would be something a court would consider when imposing sentence of uh, you know, something that's more fantastical. Last comment on that will be, though, that oftentimes a victim or recipient of a threat does not know whether it can or cannot be carried out. And therefore, the, the sense of trauma and, and terror imparted by such a threat doesn't change whether there was or was not the ability 
uh, to carry it out. So uh, in that sense, I think that um, the statute should be neutral on whether or not there's ability or not to carry out the threat. So with that, I, I thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I see Kate and then Martin. Thanks. Um, I'm having a, I'm having a lot of thoughts from earlier and and now, but I'll try to I'll try to keep it focused on Rory what you were just talking about. Um, when I thinking about two hundred three and three hundred two together in my mind, one thing that what what keeps coming up for me, and I think Rory, you were speaking to it when you were talking about the impact on a school community when someone makes a threat of that magnitude is. For me, and, and I'll own this language and others can push back, I, I feel like what we're talking about is terrorism to some degree. I, you know, I think we're talking about people taking action and making threats that impact our access to democracy, that impact our access to our social structures and society. And I, I, I hope we'll have more conversation down the road on, on this issue. I believe in Vermont we have a problem of white supremacist terrorism. And I believe that we are st struggling to address that in a comprehensive way. Um, and all of this to say, I am getting off track a little bit. Maybe again, we can come back to this later, but all this to say, I guess this is a question for you, Rory, and, and maybe Bryn or any other attorneys on here. Is that a word that is used in statute? Do we have laws within our state that address terrorism? How is that defined? Where does that fit in here? Um, I'll just pause there for a moment, but that's a question that comes to mind for me. Yeah, no, great. Thank you, Kate. Go ahead, Rory. Yeah, so the short answer is yes. I'm going to pull it up right now. So around the, uh, several years after the criminal, stat, uh, criminal threatening statute was imposed, and I think in response to the circumstances of Fairhaven, the legislature passed uh, what's called uh, domestic terrorism. It's set forth at 13 VSA 1703. And to quote from it, domestic terrorism means engaging in or taking a substantial step to commit a violation of the criminal laws of the state with the intent to A, cause death or serious bodily injury to multiple persons, or B, threaten any civilian population with mass destruction, mass killings, or kidnapping. And then it goes on uh, to further describe, uh, I'll skip serious bodily injury, but it describes substantial step as conduct that is strongly corroborative of the actor's intent to complete the commission of the offense. Uh, I believe in the past uh, legislative biennium, there was a bill that looked at an intermediate um, step between, uh, I guess, criminal threatening and domestic terrorism. Um, colloquially, other states have called that terroristic threats. For example, uh, there are states that have that in between where there's a, what would amount to criminal threatening, but directed towards a, um, a distinct group, whether that's a, a school body or a legislative you know, area. Other states have specific prohibitions on bomb threats uh, or other um, you know, direct threats on mass gatherings or, or stadiums. The distinction between domestic terrorism and its significant maximum punishment of up to 20 years is really that there's this requirement for a substantial step to be taken so we have quite the extreme range right now between a uh, one year misdemeanor for criminal threatening all the way to a 20 year felony for taking a substantial step in terms of actually trying to cause one of these you know, mass casualty or a mass terrorist, terroristic events. So there, I, my opinion is that there is room uh, within the statutory framework of Vermont to have some sort of intermediate offense where um, again, a threat causes the same type of disruption, be it an evacuation of a school building, an evacuation of the legislature, an evacuation of a state office building. These are all things that do dis cause significant disruption to uh, government operations or life uh, for our community members. And I, I guess, thank you for that answer. And I guess what comes to mind for me, you know, at the risk of getting too far away from the bills that are in front of us is what I just, you know, I, what I just heard you describe in terms of current statute related to terrorism, I didn't, it might be in there, but I didn't hear it reflected some sort of statutory acknowledgement of the psychic impact it has on society. You know what I'm saying? So what I'm, what I heard you describe was like, um, you know, the, the acts themselves or what specifically threatened or what act might be carried out. Um, but I think, again, part of what we're talking about in the context of these bills that are in front of us is the terror that it instills in people and the impact that has on their behavior. And 
I, you know, I don't know how, how we address that statutorily, but in my mind, I feel like we, we have to try to figure out how to take a stab at that component of it because it's such a massive piece of this issue. Right, thank you. And um, well, let's hear from Martin and then Rory, if you could speak more about that with that inter, you know, intermediary um, step or, or, you know, or, or statute might look like, that'd be great. Uh, Martin. Yeah, actually, I was just uh, I was going to jump to that first before the other question that I had. But isn't isn't what we're doing with this new subsection two kind of approaching this concept of the terroristic threats? You know, the subsection two on page two, starting at line seven, isn't that where that could be perhaps uh, finesse that language there? Or are you thinking of something, uh, you know, a, a separate provision uh, entirely, uh, Rory? So I think uh, I think it is a step in the direction that's a correct assessment. And I'm trying to go, I just found from, I believe it was last year, uh, I pulled it up because I wrote a letter of support to Representative Grad. Um, so this would be in the uh, 2019 to 2020 biennium of H419 was the bill. And I'll try to pull that up right now to see uh, what the what the particular language um, was, if I, if I can have a moment. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. I know I just sent Renee a, uh... <laughs> A note asking, I thought I did that, or isn't this what I'm doing here? But yeah. Okay, so I was able to identify that. Um, and in H419 from, again, this is from the 2019-2020 session, it had proposed adding to subpart C2 of criminal threatening, quote, a person who violates subsection A of this section with the intent to threaten any civilian population with mass destruction, mass killings, or kidnapping shall be imprisoned not more than five years or fined not more than $10,000 or both. And so it's a like fairly straightforward change. I'm not sure if there's other language than clarifying what that population meant, but that was, I think, striking at that sort of intermediate range of recognizing um, uh, this sort of trauma or impact on a, on a community that doesn't rise to the level of actually being a consummated act of domestic terrorism. Right, and it, but it uses the term mass or Yes, use the term mass destruction, mass killings, or kidnapping, which I believe may be barred from the definition section of um, I'm sure ledge council would be much faster finding this than, than me, but um, I think under section 1701, that covers extortion. So uh, again, well, actually it just borrows directly from section 1703, subpart A1B, which again, uh, for purposes of domestic terrorism means threaten any civilian population with mass destruction, mass killings or kidnapping. So that's taken from uh, its statutory cousin. Hmm. All right, thank, thank you. Uh, Martin, keep going. Yeah, so, um... Yeah, it, it just, it seems that we could look at this language and, and perhaps capture a little closer to what we're after, although we still have that that barrier of, of the true threat doctrine, which applies to all these things. And that that's kind of been the frustration, just to Kate's point. I mean, we, we have been trying to push against that for the last few years, and we keep on running into uh, that case law from the Supreme Court. But the other question I had, and it follows this actually, is is the um, disturbing the peace by use of telephone or other electronic communications. I have a couple questions about that. Um, one is how often is that actually used by prosecutors? I mean, how often is that charged? Is that something that used very often, Rory, that you know of? It is, it's fairly frequent, yes. Um, 
you know, not necessarily. So sometimes in the context of threats against, you know, state government employees, legislators, others, uh, it is um, frequently, I think we see it as a crime between um, citizens in the community fairly frequently. Uh, the proliferation of social media and some of the nastiness that has come with that means uh, we see a fair amount of it. Likewise, disturbing the peace by electronic means is one of the offenses that's subject to a hate crime enhancement. And uh, there have been one or two times in my recollection where we have charged that as a theory in Washington County. So the other question I have with respect to this is it seems to be broader than just the true threats doctrine. Or, I mean, in, in how do we get around that in this particular provision? Or is it just as applied and there just hasn't been uh, a situation where this has been charged where it hasn't been a true threat? So in one sense, I think that um, you could look at it this way, that the disturbing the peace by electronic means also uh, is somewhat analogous to our disorderly conduct statutes where it's, while it's victim-based, it's also uh, really a public order issue where it's disturbing the peace in some way. Um, so it's not necessarily quantified on a threat itself. And another important distinction I think is this. So the true threats doctrine applies to words itself. The analysis uh, from a prosecutorial standpoint becomes somewhat different when words are accompanied by some form of conduct. And using words to infer intent or apply meaning to conduct uh, is somewhat different. And even in the criminal threatening statute we're dealing with, the first part of it is important, which is by words or conduct because certainly there can be conduct that is directly threatening or places someone in reasonable fear of uh, reasonable apprehension of death or, or serious bodily injury. Um, there are a number of other, again, analogous or closely related offenses. So, you know, brandishing a weapon and, and then saying something threatening to someone that may not qualify as a true threat could probably satisfy criminal threatening. Pointing it at someone could also uh, qualify as criminal threatening or reckless endangerment under the circumstances. All right, thank you. Uh, Kate. Thanks, yeah, I mean, just, again, not, <laughs> not to dig us too far off, but just in response to Rory's statements about the definition of terrorism, I, I just wanna, I just wanna name that I, it concerns me that the definition is bound around threats of, of quote unquote mass action. I just don't think that it, fully reflects the insidious nature of terrorism, particularly, you know, I'm going to go ahead and talk about white supremacist terrorism, where threats against an individual, a person of color, for example, particularly in a public space, has a ripple effect. It terrorizes a, a full community of people. And so Again, if we're if we're going to be looking at this kind of thing, I don't know how that translates into law. I'm sure there's all kinds of complexities and reasons why we haven't gotten this right. But I think we have to try to figure out some way of honoring that reality. Um, that it's not just it, it, if we only define it around a ma an action against a mass group of people, we are missing a significant component of the problem. Yeah, thank you. And, and Rory, I appreciate you speaking to that because I'm um, getting hung up on that as well. So some other ideas that you could have to broaden that language would be, you know, against a, off the top of my head, some sort of, you know, an entity, a commission, board, uh, governmental organization, or, a, you know, or a cognizable group of individuals. And, and I think that comes to mind where, you know, just thinking of how other states have approached this or just conceptually, you know, we'd want to protect a church congregation just the same as we want to protect a school, I imagine. That's a discrete you know, group or organization of people who may have something in common uh, that results in you know, some sort of threat. And of, of course, once we get to you know, different groupings like that, um, it's not easy then to apply necessarily a hate crime enhancement uh, because it may be something that's neutral and may have membership from a, you know, mul of you know, multiple people um, from very different backgrounds. So it does fall into the zone where there isn't an existing statutory mechanism to then give a group or that collection of people some sort of, I guess, protection to answer your concern, which is the sort of collective trauma or terror that comes from a threat directed towards an entity, for lack of a better term, or organization. Great, thank you. Uh, Martin. Uh, so, 
I'm still kind of uh, I'm looking at the disturbing the peace. I, I I know it's not the bill before us, but it's getting at some of the same behavior we're after here. But uh, I'm curious. Uh, I'm not going to. I'm not sure if I remember the name of the case right. Maybe it's Schenk, uh, but the, the Ku, Ku Klux Klan distribution of flyers that was held to be protected speech, and that was brought under the not this disturbing the uh, the peace, but it was a disturbing the peace. Uh, charge and it was found that there still had to be a true threat in that situation. Is that affect how the disturbing the peace by use of telephone or other electronic communications, how that particular provision or can be used? So I don't believe so. And uh, so the Shank matter was charged as a disorderly uh, conduct offense. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So that, that explains. I'm, then go go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's okay. So, and just for reference, disorderly conduct at, right now has four different theories. One is by engaging in fighting, violent, tumultuous, or threatening behavior. Another is the use of obscene or abusive language in a public place. Another one is disturbing a lawful assembly. And I feel like uh, I feel like Rick Scott at the presidential debate and forget one of the things <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about, but. Uh, the final, oh, the final prong is unreasonable noise. And the caveat is to all these disorderly conduct ideas is that it has to reason, either causes or recklessly creates a risk of public annoyance or public inconvenience. And that's, I think, the key distinction here is what is the impact? And so when you look at um, disturbing the peace by electronic means, it can entail disturbing the peace and quiet right of privacy that's generally associated with the repeated calls or repeated messages uh, of some nature. But also when reading that language, it says to terrify, intimidate, harass, or annoy. So you're dealing with, again, a lower standard here where it falls more in the line of a public disorder versus it being a cognizable or direct threat against someone. And again, it, because this is sort of receiving a phone call or receiving some sort of directed electronic communication, it's, you know, behavior that's directly seeking someone out. Uh, so that, I think that's where our, try to, you know, doing an analysis on the fly, but I think that's a big part of the intent element, which is someone's purposely trying to reach into a private place, presumably a home or someone sitting there with their phone to disturb them or harass or annoy them, so. Thank you. Yeah, and um, committee members, no apologies needed about, I, I think everybody's right on point <laughs> in terms of, you know, I think this is a really helpful discussion. And, and so if we if, if we stray from from these two particular bills, I'm, I don't see it as straying. I think it's, I think it's important. So, so please keep, keep your thoughts and, and questions going. Uh, I'm not seeing any hands right now. Okay. All right, Rory, anything? No, I have nothing further. I really appreciate the, uh, the common discussion. Uh, this is always an interesting topic to talk about, and uh, I look forward to uh, seeing what the committee can uh, come up with. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Actually, why don't we go to Marshall now, please? Can I just ask the question before I forget the question uh, yeah. that I had earlier on 302, and I'll probably forget it again if we keep on going right now. Yeah. And I think it might be for Bryn as much as anybody, but I guess Bryn's not here. Um, maybe I'll throw, well, let me throw this just so I, I'm just wondering on the uh, 302, uh, it's on page two, uh, lines 16 and 17. Actually, this could be a question for Marshall. Now I'm thinking of it. Let me just flag it for you now, but uh, and you can get to it later, where it says the under 18 years of age shall be adjudicated as a juvenile delinquent. Uh, should that be changed consistent with what we're doing with juvenile justice and raising the age? And that that's kind of a, you know, it's not what's really before us, but if you could just flag that, Marshall, to hit on when you talk about this bill for us. Sure, I can do that. Okay. Thank um, you. Hold on one moment. All right, thank you and good morning. Um, I think as others have discussed, I'm going to start by talking about um, really the idea of deterrence and enhanced penalties in the first place, just as a starting point. Um, and that is to say that both of these bills 
uh, really are very clearly meant to deter behavior by enhancing penalties. And frankly, that doesn't work. Um, you know, even most recently, uh, the U United States Department of Justice um, has joined the sort of bandwagon of people who are coming around to the view based on years and years and years of studies and research that um, you're, not, you're not actually adding any appreciable deterrent value by increasing penalties on crimes. That there's really one thing that they have identified um, that the criminal justice system can do that actually does have a significant deterrent effect on crimes. And that's to increase the perception of certainty of, that you will be caught and or punished. That's what has an effect on deterrence. Increasing penalties, no, no effect on deterrence. Um, so it's not, you know, there's no reason to pass these bills if the idea is to deter people from engaging in this conduct. Um, really the only reason to increase penalties on any offense is because you want people to spend more time in jail than they are currently spending. And I would even take it a step further than that, which is that, you know, if you have people who are being sentenced under the current law and aren't being sentenced to the maximum, you know, to, to a very high sentence, uh, essentially where the judge is bouncing up against the maximum penalty, then increasing the maximum penalty isn't going to do anything, isn't going to have any effect anyway, um, because judges already have some range of sentence and they are not sentencing up to the max of it. So unless the idea is that the committee is looking at the people who are being prosecuted for criminal threatening and thinking, man, some of these people are getting sentenced to what is essentially a maximum sentence, um, but we think that they need to spend longer in a cell, that would be the reason to increase penalties because that's what happens. When penalties are increased, people go to jail for longer. Um, more people go to jail and the people who go to jail go to jail for longer. Um, in past years, I've brought in my copy of the 1972 version of Title 13. Um, and I've also brought in the chart of showing the rates of uh, incarceration on a per capita basis and how that's inc increased over the years and showing the, the comparison between my 1972 Title 13, which is about three quarters of an inch thick, and my 2020 Title 13, which is about four inches thick, um, you know, which I do sort of tongue in cheek to make the point. But the point is there, which is that as the legislature increases the number of offenses, increases the scope of those offenses, and increases the penalties attached to those offenses, rates of incarceration go up. That's what drives incarceration rates. Um, you know, they've done a lot of studies, especially recently, looking at what parts of the criminal justice system have the greatest effect on incarceration rates. Is it prosecutorial discretion? Is it uh, you know, quality of defense is, does it have something to do with what happens uh, when people go to DOC? And what they've found is that the driving factor is legislation. Legislation drives incarceration. When there are enhanced penalties, there will be a more incarceration. And so that gets me to sort of what the purpose of the bill is. And I think that in listening to the really very enlightening conversation about the bill, um, you know, it, it doesn't strike me that most of the most of what I heard was not complaints that there's not high enough penalties. Most of what I heard was concerns and complaints that either true threats are not being prosecuted or that there are things that fall short of being a true threat that are nonetheless scary and dangerous and difficult and in some cases sufficient to really affect the way that people carry out their business and go about their lives and represent the people of the state of Vermont. And that is true. That is undoubtedly true. I, you know, I speak as someone who quit being a member of my water board after receiving threats, um, which is actually kind of funny. I was on the school board and the water board. Um, and somehow on the water board, I got threatened multiple times. Nobody seemed to care about me on the school board. Um, but the water board was, that stirred people up. 
Um, and I quit doing the job because I just, it wasn't worth it. It was, I wasn't getting paid for it. It was, you know, totally volunteer and it just wasn't worth having people show up at my house threatening me over waterboard politics. And so I quit. That said, you know, none of that ever was anything that could be prosecuted. It was never true threats. It was the kind of threatening words and conduct that is scary and might change. And in fact, in my case, did drive me to change what I was doing and to quit a job or quit a role that just wasn't worth doing if I was going to be threatened doing it. Um, and yet it wasn't prosecutable in any way. Um, I think that some of the conversation around the use of, for example, the um, disturbing the peace by electronic means statute has been valuable. I think one of the things that was a little lost in um, Attorney Tebow's explanation of that is it's still hemmed in by true threats. The, the ways that that statute can be used that don't have a true threats analysis to it um, are totally legitimate, but it's totally taken out of the, um, the content of that speech. So just to give some examples, um, you know, Attorney Tebow is correct that a combination of speech and conduct can amount to a true threat. You know, if somebody simply walks up to somebody's house with a gun, that's not necessarily a true threat. If they say something that doesn't have a, um, an element of imminence to it, that wouldn't alone be a true threat because imminence is one of the requires, requirements of a true threat. But the fact that they, you know, their conduct put them presently in front of someone's house with a gun, you know, with the means to carry out that threat, that might satisfy the imminence portion. So that might allow you to say, okay, this is a true threat. But what it doesn't, what that statute doesn't allow you to do is it doesn't allow you to circumvent the true threats doctrine. So for example, if somebody is calling up a house and making statements that are rude and uh, you know, threatening but not yet a true threat, um, the only way that could be prosecuted is if the, as something other than a true threat, is if the conduct itself, without any look at the content of the speech, was alone enough to, to satisfy one of those other elements, that it is annoying, intimidating, or harassing. Um, you know, that has to be done only by looking at the conduct, not at the speech, because the moment that you look at the speech, then you're into a content-based restriction on speech. If you have to look at what the content is, then the restriction is content-based. If it's content-based, then it has to fall into one of the categories of unprotected speech. The obvious one in this case would be a true threat. So it has to satisfy the entire true threat doctrine. So I, I say that only to just say that, you know, the, these are problems that pervade the entire system of, you know, our entire statutory scheme. We're not gonna find a way to avoid the true threats doctrine and punish speech as speech that is not, um, you know, a imminent threat of uh, intended to cause somebody fear that someone's going to do bodily injury to themselves or their family. That's there's not going to be a way around that. Um, and so all we're talking about here, we're not talking about changing the scope of what's punished um, or expanding the uh, types of speech that can lead to punishment. All we are talking about is how much should people be punished. And it's our position that unless the legislature is sitting there saying, man, there's people who are going to jail for this, but they are not going to jail for long enough and we want them to go to jail for longer, that this penalty enhancement scheme is not the way to go. Um, looking at the statute regarding schools, we also think that that's just unnecessary because because it's, duplicative. We already have the domestic terrorism statute, which is kind of absurdly a 20 year felony for conduct that can amount to only a threat. You know, if you read section A1, it says domestic terrorism means engaging in or taking a substantial step to commit a violation of the criminal laws of this state with the intent to, and then subsection B is threaten any civilian population 
with mass destruction, mass killings, or kidnappings. That is that almost entirely um, encompasses the conduct that's described in the proposed uh, school threatening enhancement. Um, and it already, it, it doesn't require any sort of a completed act because engaging in a violation of the criminal laws of the state can include violating the criminal threatening law, such that making a criminal threat to a school or to any other place where you are threatening um, you know, any population larger than just a single individual, um, you are running afoul of domestic terrorism law, and that already has a 20-year felony um, sentence associated with it. So our position is that, well, I certainly agree that the, that the, the type of speech and conduct that the committee is concerned about is incredibly concerning and really destructive and damaging. There's gotta be a way to address it that's not just by saying, we're gonna lock more people up for more time because that's not gonna work. It's not gonna deter people from engaging in the conduct. Um, people who spend time in jail uh, when it is not absolutely necessary for the protection of the public uh, typically come out of it with a greater risk of recidivism than when they went in, um, meaning more likely to commit further crimes in the future than when they went in. So the real question here I think is just what is this going to accomplish? And I don't see it accomplishing anything that is really kind of reflecting the the values that um, the values of the state of Vermont. Thank you, Marsha. I I appreciate that. Uh, and it's interesting having this conversation. I, I was remembering what a few years ago we we wanted a moratorium on no more crimes, right? <laughs> So, Barbara. So, Marshall, I really appreciate um, you talking about the DOJ research. And so I'm wondering, again, if it's not um, making a new crime, which I struggled with, too, uh, when I introduced this bill, but how can we communicate the certain um, the certain message that you will be caught and punished? I mean, that makes me again think it's the signs play. I mean, it does seem like threatening, knock on wood, threatening child abuse, um, DCF workers has, I haven't heard about that in a few years and I'm feeling like that got better. I don't know about better or worse. I know that it still has been happening and happening with some frequency. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I wouldn't necessarily say that's that's gotten better. I do think, you know, that the sign I should have mentioned when I was testifying because that's a perfect example. Um, you know, it's it's not about necessarily making, you know, increasing the actual certainty of um, detection and punishment. It's about increasing the perception of certainty of um, detection and punishment. And a sign is a perfect example. Just that little reminder to people as they walk into the building saying, you know, this is, this is the expectation, this is what the law is. Keep that in mind as you walk into this building. You're certainly sending the message when you highlight that, you know, right, right front and center that, you know, if you do this, we will press charges, you will be prosecuted, do not do this. That's exactly the kind of thing that does have an effect on people's behavior. Um, you know, it's something totally anecdotally, we see it, um, we've changed some of, and I don't remember all the details of, you know, what our signs at our office say, but we've changed signs in our office because we often get fairly upset people coming to our office with concerns and questions and problems and, um, you know, and we've had some scary incidents and we've changed some of the ways that we address uh, people as they come into the, our office building, both right at our front door and up at our reception desk. Um, and anecdotally, that's changed people's behavior. Um, it really, I think that's a perfect, that sign is a perfect example of the kinds of things that can be used to really have an effect on people's behavior. 
Peyton and Tom. You know, just to, before I jump away from that, um, one of the things that I think is a great example of that is uh, they've shown that the, you know, those speed limit signs on the road that, that, that register your speed limit and show you what it is, those, have, those are one of the best, they have one of the greatest impacts on actually changing driver's behavior on the roads. And it's not changing the actual certainty that someone will be detected and prosecuted or ticketed for speeding. What it's doing is just giving people a reminder that saying essentially, look, you're traveling too fast and look at how easy it is to catch you. This sign just caught you. Um, and that, that, that has one of the most significant impacts on people's driving behavior of anything they've done. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that point. Uh, okay, um, Kate and then Tom. Thanks. Um, so Marshall, you were just describing that there currently exists sort of a pathway within the judicial system to address threats to schools um, through the domestic terrorism statute. And I guess I'm curious, and I don't know if this is a question for you or maybe David or Rory, but I guess I'm curious if that avenue you just described has been pursued within the state um, for folks who have made those kinds of threats or, or how presently um, those kinds of threats are being addressed. I don't know the answer to that. I certainly have not had a domestic terrorism case cross my desk. Um, and I don't know whether any have been filed. Um, it, I certainly don't see every charge that comes around. It would be something that's prosecuted rarely because thankfully these kinds of threats are in fact pretty rare. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I have absolutely no idea whether one's been filed or not in a school case. I would say this, I don't necessarily oppose the idea of some intermediate statute as attorney Tebow proposed that essentially removes the um, threats of domestic terrorism to a lesser penalty than actual committed acts of domestic terrorism. Um, in terms of how it's been used, I really, you know, I, I don't have any information on that. Um, I know that it is, you know, our domestic terrorism statute is actually very similar to domestic terrorism statutes in other states. Uh, I did a training not too long ago with the National Juvenile Defender Center where we put up domestic terrorism statutes from all over the country um, and just talk to, talking about how they were used all over the country. And it is certainly something that gets prosecuted regularly um, if you start looking at it nationwide. Um, and that's prosecuted regularly using statutes very similar to ours. I would say about it, I mean, to me, it is a disproportionate response. I understand that, you know, times are different than they used to be, um, but a 20 year felony for people who are, you know, essentially calling in a bomb threat. I mean, when I was a kid, and I'm not saying that, that the response back when I was a kid was necessarily appropriate, um, but when I was a kid, that was handled internally. That was, you know, they, their kids called in bomb threats to avoid tests. And honestly, you know, there would always be some sort of a, a, a suspension or, a, or, a, or um, what do you call it, detention. Um, but the main penalty was that you got a zero on whatever test it is that you were calling in a bomb threat to avoid. And we've come all the way in, you know, whatever it's been 30 years since I've been in high school uh, to it being, you know, it's gone from something that was a school discipline matter to being something that's now a 20 year felony right up there with, um, you know, murder and manslaughter, tired and manslaughter. Um, so it's, to me, it's already a disproportionate response. And I certainly would agree that moving it, whether it's done within the domestic terrorism statute or whether it's done by creating a terroristic threat statute, but that, that in either event, essentially removing the threats of domestic terrorism to a lower penalty than actual committed acts of domestic terrorism, I think would be a very appropriate move. Thanks. I mean, I just, I guess to add a, a quick comment to that, I mean, I think I appreciate everything that you're saying, and it seems as though even if we technically have a statutory path that might allow us to hold someone accountable in the court of law, I think part of what you're speaking to is if it is 
is perceived as a disproportionate response, it may not be an avenue that people pursue. And we find our, and I feel like often in these situations that we're talking about related to schools, it's often young people. And I think there's a, a real, I think, good <laughs> desire probably to not want to pursue a domestic terrorism charge against a young person. Um, but it doesn't, you know, that, that doesn't solve the problem that we're dealing with. I, you know, I would be shocked if there was any prosecutors who were not pursuing a legitimate domestic terrorism charge simply because they felt that the penalty was too high. Um, and I would, you know, if we're talking about a high school student, if they are under the age of 19, that would be prosecuted in juvenile court. It would be, um, you know, that would be a confidential matter and the penalty would not really matter to the juvenile court because the juvenile court does not, you know, they issue dispositions, not sentences, and they're not based on the maximum or minimum sentence that's uh, in the statute. So I don't think it would have an effect on it. I think what it really is a reflection of is that, um, you know, in the school threats cases that I've been involved with since the domestic terrorism statute passed, um, those, and, and, you know, I'm not suggesting that I've seen a necessarily a representative sample of those, um, but frankly, in a lot of those cases, either the threat was not actually a true threat and therefore not prosecutable as a true threat, um, or it was a threat that was made by somebody who, you know, it, it shouldn't have been charged as domestic terrorism. It shouldn't have even been charged as a criminal threat because that's not really the problem that we were dealing with. You know, it was kids who had profound, very serious mental illness and, you know, what they needed was not to be charged with a delinquency, but instead to get treatment. Um, and so, I mean, to me, I, I, I don't think that there's some problem where domestic terrorism cases are out there and just not getting charged. I frankly just can't imagine that from any of the prosecutors that I've worked with. Thank you, uh, Tom and then Martin. Thank you. Um, I like what you said about per, uh, perception, Marshall. I mean, there's, there's no uh, uh, organization uh, anywhere that does a better job as far as perception goes um, with convictions than the IRS. Um, I mean, the IRS, they, uh, your chances of getting audited are uh, about as close to zero as you can get. But the, but the perception with the IRS is that uh, you are going to get audited. And if you have made a, you know, uh, done something that you are going to jail. I mean, that's, I think that's pretty universal as far as the IRS goes, but um, so, and so it's just going through my mind is how to increase, how to increase the perception that, um, you know, that somebody could be, could be charged with this. And is it, I guess, is it the, the lack of uh, uh, um, resources that people aren't getting charged uh or is it that uh, whatever they're doing doesn't rise to the um, um, to the level of breaking the law? No, I don't. I, yeah, that. I'm sorry. Go I, ahead. I never see cases that don't get charged. I only see them when they do get charged. Um, so I'm in a little bit of a different. You know, I'm situated differently than Attorney Tebow or Attorney Schur, who are prosecutors and are you know they see things that I don't see because they see cases where the cops come to them and say, what do we do with this? And they have to make the decision whether it gets charged or not. If it's never charged, I never see it. So I only see the ones that get charged. And frankly, you know, if you ask me to speculate, I would imagine that most of what you, what is concerning the committee is the cases that aren't chargeable. Um, you know, all over the country, everybody, has a perception of what is a threat that should be prosecuted that is very different from what the United States Supreme Court has said is a threat that can be prosecuted. Um, it is not at all intuitive. If you think about, like if you read the statutes on threatening and if you think about what types of threats cause people 
fear, caused people anxiety, caused people, um, you know, real grave concern for their own health um, and safety and for the safety of their families. And, you know, that you would, you would imagine that, that 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 kind of that everything that fits in that category would be prosecutable, but it's not. Um, you know, the United States Supreme Court's lines on this have been drawn a long time ago, and they've been upheld over and over again. And they are not in keeping with what most people think of when they think of a threat. So, what I imagine you know you're getting at is actually that there's a lot of cases out there that people look at and they say this is horrible behavior. This is behavior that should be prosecuted and should be punished, but frankly, it's constitutionally protected speech. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. So I'd like to follow up a little bit on what you're just talking about with the, the Supreme Court and the true threat doctrine and how that works with our criminal threatening uh, law. So I just want to make sure I understand. So a person makes a threat to another person and and the result of the threat places the person in reasonable apprehension of death or serious bodily injury. Is, is that those two elements, is that following what, uh, generally what the Supreme Court is, is or requiring? With an additional element that it be, um, it's got to be a threat of imminent uh, death or serious bodily injury. Okay, so how how is this? All right, so, so serious bodily injury. One of the definitions that we have in statute for serious bodily injury is substantial impairment of health. I mean, has the Supreme Court or or, or cases following the Supreme Court precedent provided any further definition of what that means? Substantial impairment of health, or more generally, serious bodily injury that you know of. Not off the top of my head. I can do a little research and get back to the committee on that. Yeah, I'm just I'm just really curious uh, uh, as far as substantial impairment of health. And this <clears throat> this is kind of getting to new understandings. And, and this is something I would look to Kate to probably <laughs> chime in on that that uh, the the stresses, the the uh, PTSD, the psychiatric harm that can occur you know, does that ever amount to a substantial impairment of health? Is it, I'm Because I know there's been a lot of advances in understanding how that psychological harm can result in actual, you know, the, the physical harm. Um, so I can, I can give you a bit of it. Now that I understand the question a little better, I can give you a little bit of an answer, which is the Supreme Court has never recognized anything besides physical harm as the harm at issue in a true threats case. Um, does that mean that they won't in the future? I don't know. It really depends on who winds up sitting on the Supreme Court in the future. I think it's pretty safe to say that the Supreme Court right now would not expand um, First Amendment doctrine to include uh, psychological harm in the true threats analysis. Um, and I say that just because it's a the um, the particularly the people who are described, and I don't think it's necessarily an apt description, but are described as the conservative members of the court um, have been very clear about not expanding exceptions to the First Amendment doctrine, uh, to First Amendment law any further than they're already expanded. And they now make up a, you know, essentially a six to three majority on the court. Right, I guess my, my point only is that cycle, it's not separate from from physical harm. And, and, and that's kind of where my understanding of the science is that, that psychological harm definitely has physical harm uh, impacts. Uh, and I guess, yeah, that, that's, but I had one other question on, um, and that was back to that 18 year old question on the page two line 16, 17, if that's still accurate as far as where we're going with juvenile justice. No, that should be changed to 19. That was put in to essentially say that, um, though, honestly, you know, I think that as long as, hold on, I'm just trying to flip to make sure that I'm on the right statute here. So it may actually be something that can be deleted entirely. I have to take a quick look at it because as long as criminal threatening so if we were to put in the section that says, 
that includes the enhanced penalty, um, then we would need the, that provision would need to remain there. Without the enhanced penalty, um, then anyone under 19 already has to be adjudicated as juvenile delinquent. Um, there's no way to transfer this one up. The enhanced penalty turns it into a felony, which would mean it could be transferred up. So, so if it's if we don't have the enhanced penalty, we should strike that uh, sentence. But if we keep the 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 enhancement and subsection two is what you're talking about, right? As far as yeah the threatening use of firearm explosive device in the school building. If that stays, then this should change to 19 years. Yes. Okay, thanks. Otherwise it should go. All right, thanks. Okay, let's see any other hands, any other questions for Marshall? Not seeing any. Thank you, anything, anything else Marshall? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, let's go to the Attorney General's office. David Chair, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks uh, to the committee for considering these issues. Um, the David Chair with the Attorney General's office for the record. Uh, these are profoundly important issues and they get to the heart of civil society, how we live together, how we govern ourselves, how we uh, can have um, governance and debate in ways that are um, consonant with democratic norms and consonant with how we uh, need to live civilly together and, and govern our communities. They're very tough issues. Um, when our office thinks about adding penalties or enhanced penalties or um, um, adding new crimes, as a philosophical matter, we generally look at it with a presumption against doing so. That doesn't mean, of course, that uh, that presumption prevails in every case. As the committee well knows, we've supported uh, enhancements uh, it's to the hate crime statute this uh, session and to the, um, and obviously we actually affirmatively requested uh, an expansion on the um, child sexual abuse materials uh, section. On, on the flip side though, you know, when, the legislation was being drafted directing the Sentencing Commission to recategorize offenses we've supported and I may be misremembering, but I think we may have even proposed the provision that um, carried a strong presumption against enhancing penalties during the recategorization process. So that's the lens we look at these things through. Um, I think you know, when, when we look at these statutes, I think um, we'd actually agree with points that uh, attorney Paul made and that representative Lalonde made around the reality of deterrence uh, and the sort of certainty of penalty enforcement, if you will. Um, it is the case, you know, that this is statistically very strong that increasing penalties does not really change behavior. Certainty of enforcement does change behavior, or I should say the belief in the certainty of an enforcement changes the be changes behavior. We have a real problem. There's, there's two issues here that are sort of bumping up against each other when we think about these concepts. One is that the true threats doctrine and the Supreme Court jurisprudence do limit quite significantly what the government can do to uh, punish speech. And, um, in the modern era, enforcement, even for those things that are enforceable, is quite difficult. And because of the nature of electronic communications and, you know, attorney, or sorry, representative not discussed um, the, the websites where it's very easy to mask where something's coming from. And it does make enforcement very difficult, even for those things that are prosecutable or perhaps civilly enforceable in certain cases. Um, and I think that is resulting in extraordinary frustration and, and uh, appropriate frustration around how we address these issues. Uh, I think that, um, you know, when we, I think there's a number of things we have to do better. One is we have to do enforcement better. And I don't, I can't sit here right now and say to this committee that we have the answers on that, but I think that is the case. Um, and I think that we also have to approach these issues from multi-pronged, in a multi-pronged manner. 
because the reality of First Amendment doctrine means that we cannot uh, punish behavior that is reprehensible in many cases and in cases that feel like it is deserving of punishment. Attorney Paul referenced that, you know, he, as by, by the nature of his job, doesn't see cases where, um, where charges have not been brought, but I can say, and I think it's, it's known to some degree that our office has confronted those issues where uh, there is behavior that is reprehensible that is also not chargeable. Um, and it's very difficult. And I think it leaves people feeling unprotected, uh, very fairly so. Um, I think that you know our, our approach on, on bills like this is while we would not stand here and oppose them because I understand that there is at, at so maybe at best a message that's being sent. Um, I agree with the testimony that says that it is unlikely that this will deter or change behavior and that what is more likely in the long run to do that uh, is sort of a multifaceted approach that it will include things like making sure that bias related incidents are being reported uh, you know as quickly and comprehensively as they can to make sure that even non-criminal responses are being brought to bear where appropriate that also but that also is going to mean things that have that are completely outside of the judicial responses that are completely outside of the judicial system entirely and we've actually been talking about this with some communities about how this could work uh, and that that will mean things like uh, community organizations where in which people may have may feel comfortable or have already have relationships that bring restorative processes to bear um, I know that that sounds strange in the context of offenders, and I use that term broadly, not necessarily meaning criminal offenders, but I, uh, in the context of offenders who may be remorseless in, in their behavior or may be unknown. But it's also the case we've found, and we've discussed this with partners in other states, that uh, those types of responses where a community comes together around somebody can in fact be healing and make people feel safer. Um, but I also understand that that can feel to the broad public like an, an, an inadequate response. That being said, it's often the only real response that's available because there isn't a legal response given the restrictions of, uh, of First Amendment doctrine. Um, and, uh, and I also will emphasize that we are believers in that type of response, that, that even, even though that may feel inadequate, from the public perception standpoint, we know from having talked to individuals that that type of response can, in fact, uh, deliver some real uh, uh, comfort and, res and resolution for them, even when a perpetrator is not either unknown or, or not willing to engage. Um, all, all that is to say that these are profoundly difficult questions. Um, I appreciate, and, and I, let me address the public officials issue as well. You know, I think, again, this goes to the heart of democratic governance. We should not have it be the case that people are prevented from serving or stop serving or um, don't, you know, are, are fearful of serving in the first place because of threatening speech and threatening language. And this is a problem that we need to tackle. Uh, and I think that being diligent where enforcement is possible is going to be something that we need to do. You know, I think that uh, having a response that that feels serious to the people who have been threatened is important, even if the ultimate outcome of that response is that there cannot be a criminal sanction or a criminal charge brought. Um, people need to feel that government is listening to them and is responding. Uh, you know, in our office, uh, our victim's advocate, Amy Farr, does extraordinary work with people, uh, making sure that they uh, do have that feeling that there is a government there that is listening, almost regardless of what legal process may happen. Um, and I think those types of responses, those more that holistic approach is going to be necessary to deal with some of these broad issues, uh, because, in part because the limitations uh, placed by the Constitution mean that criminal sanctions uh, are not are simply not going to be available to a lot of the behavior that concerns us most. So I realize that that um, is a little bit rambling, a little bit philosophical, but it is where we're coming from on this stuff. It, I, I will also note for the record, I, you know, I 
we were actually going to have a, one of our First Amendment folks in our office testify today, and they were unable to. That they did review it and didn't feel that there was, uh, as drafted anyway, that there were constitutional concerns with what's there. Um, we don't think that there are impositions on the First Amendment uh, in terms of what's been proposed. So that want to state that for the record. The the sort of way we're looking at this is really coming from more prudential standpoint and from the standpoint of an office that frankly has really grappled and at times struggled with how to be a government agency that is responsive uh, on in territory that's very difficult and i think we have to acknowledge you know i've heard even though these bills are not designed specifically with this in the language, uh, I've heard this discussion today, and I think it's important to acknowledge that BIPOC Vermonters have not felt protected by their government. And uh, that's also something that we've really grappled with through ver in various ways, through various entities and, and in various discussions that we've had. Um, so again, all of this stuff I think is really profound. It's really uh, important that we talk about this and, and do what we can to address it in this moment in particular. Um, again, we, we don't object to these bills, and I think it's also the case that the testimony you've heard about deterrence and enforcement versus enforcement is, is true. It's, we agree with that, those points, um, and I think some of the thinking that we need to do and some of the resources that need to be invested is around both the broader community responses that I talked about and also thinking about um, making sure that we have the abilities to the ability to bring enforcement where that is possible in order to sort of send that message and to to activate what is actually deterrent um, a deterrent effect. So I, I hope that that is a little bit helpful. I apologize for being rather philosophical, but that you know when you're we're dealing with bills like this that are really profound in effect. Uh, some really fundamental ways in which society operates, which our democracy operates, which people in which people may feel their identities threatened. Uh, it calls that forth, um, but I hope I've given you a little bit of a brief overview of the legal standpoint as well. Okay, you have, and yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I see Kate Sando. Thanks. Um, hi, David. Thanks for the testimony, and I appreciate that there's a desire within your office to bring some creative thinking to this issue. Um, you know, I, I don't, it's, it's not a secret that your office has been at the center of some of, some of these issues in terms of whether or not to move forward with, with prosecuting certain, in certain situations. And this whole conversation of like, what really matters most is whether the public believes that you know, they will be held accountable or that, uh, that others will be held accountable, you know, whether or not someone is charged or whether or not we move forward with certain prosecution um, matters in those moments. And I, you know, this isn't to be critical of your office. Uh, you know, there are, I'm sure, a million legal issues that are taking place behind the scenes in these moments. But one point I just want to make, um, First is, you know, you said it leaves people, quote, feeling unprotected. And I would just push back a little and say, I think it leaves people unprotected. Um, and I think part of part of what we're trying to get at in this conversation is, um, you know, for all the good statute we do have on the book, people are being left unprotected in some of these situations. And we're trying to figure out what steps need to be taken. And maybe part of the nature of this conversation is that maybe, you know, looking to the court specifically for the answer isn't, isn't, it's certainly not the totality of the answer. Um, but I guess I have a couple uh, comment and then, and then a bit of a question is, um, you know, it feels like as we're having this conversation, there's this awareness that, again, there's limitations within the judi judicial system and that this is such a massive and complex issue that involves more than just the court. And there's part of me that feels inclined with this kind of issue to like, you know, strike it all and look at a task force that is looking at <laughs> this as a broader, you know, how do we pull in like multiple entities? This is a, this is a, far-reaching systemic issue. And for me, I'm talking about, again, this issue of, of terrorism as we see it play out today. 
Um, but that's sort of my comment is like, how do we, how do we go outside of just trying to tackle this through like one bill at a time, bringing enhancements or looking at specific populations or, but like looking at this as a broader issue that impacts multiple areas of government. The question I guess I would have is, you know, you're acknowledging that this is really complex and that you're having these conversations within your office. And I guess I would, my question is, what have you guys come to, if anything, like in the midst of these conversations of how do we help people to be protected? Have you come to any answers? Do you have any feedback about how, you know, we look at issues like Paulet, we look at issues like Kaya Morris, like how, how do we build systems that leave people better protected? It's, it's an essential question and a couple things. One, we certainly have been having these conversations and they have certainly not been limited to within our office. We, we really are uh, trying to reach out to community groups and uh, individuals who work on these issues and thinking through um, what is going to be helpful and workable and also feel like a real response. Um, the answers are uh, complex. I think some of the answers that we've heard, frankly, are that uh, sometimes government officials are not the people that, um, that harmed individuals want to hear from or need to hear from, and that the best role that a government official can play is to maybe quietly, maybe behind the scenes, uh, connect a person with a pre-existing community support that they may be familiar with or may not be familiar with, but a community support where they are going to feel um, comfortable and not intimidated. Um, and, you know, people who, who are not from, you know, Montpelier is far both uh, geographically and psychologically for many people in the state and not coming from, a, you know, a distant central office, but somebody who lives near where they live or people who live near where they live are based where, near where they live um, and can provide the sort of um, you know, response that feels like is in their, their community, not just some distant office holders or bureaucrats, but people in their community are responding, um, are helping them get through what they need to get through. Uh, and providing them the support that they need. So that is one thing that we've heard really clearly is that some of the answer here is building a network of community supports. Uh, and there's a lot of groups like this around Vermont um, that, that do this sort of work, provide services to um, people who belong to protected classes. And, um, and we need to take advantage of those networks and do a better job of connecting government bureaucrats and officials with those networks to make sure that that type of response is there and that type of support can be uh, tapped into. Another thing we've talked about is things like the community justice centers, which uh, have a sort of broader purview in the sense that they serve a lot of different people. They may not be sort of like a community organization in the way that I was just talking about, or, but they are also often um, very well connected within their communities. They know the schools. They know the um, the police departments. They will they will know of incidents that may not even you know get to the point of a write up in something. And making sure that they're a part of this network too is important as well. So using sort of pre existing entities that are that in that case they are government funded but are very community based um, uh, is going to be a part of the answer too. So that, and that's all of that is not to say, and I want to be clear, it's not to say we are throwing up our hands and saying, you know, the sort of official legal responses, we can't do it. That's certainly not the case. I want to be clear on that. We want to make sure we're hearing about everything in order to, which is part of the incident response system we've tried, we've been working on building out in order to be sure that when there is a government response available, that we can bring that to bear whenever appropriate. But, um, whether that's criminal or, or civil. But uh, we also understand that A, that will not be available in some cases, and B, even when it is available, frankly, that can feel alienating to people who we are trying to help, which is, again, not to say that that's government action isn't going to happen, but that there needs to be more in order to make people feel like they are being adequately supported. Um, so I think uh, the answers here are going to be oftentimes very community oriented answers in ways that I think, frankly, government has not always acted before. And we're sort of stretching ourselves a bit to try to make those contacts and build out programming that um, 
and again, some, some of this is not, this is not going to be like headline stuff, right? It's going to be stuff that if we're doing it right, people in some cases aren't going to know we were involved because that's not what the person needs or wants. Um, but that's what we think is going to be necessary to really start to build out this type of response that hopefully will, will help people. Um, where government, where sort of official courtroom related action is not available. So I don't know if that was helpful or not, but just giving you a picture of the types of conversations we're having in our office, but also around Vermont with community members and organizations. Thank you. I, I did find that helpful. And I think it sort of echoes some of what my senses and experiences as well, that this is, we have to find creative community-based solutions in addition to the judicial system. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, Tom, you get the, the last question or comment. <laughs> the last go. word. <laughs> yep. <laughs> David, uh, uh, good morning. Uh, but I don't know if this is for you or for Rory or maybe for both, but uh, from you know what Marshall was saying, he, he only sees the cases that are going to be prosecuted. So what went through my mind with that is the, the cases that do uh, cross the line into criminal threatening, um, what's happening with them? Uh, I mean, I pr can probably guess that some of them are thrown out, even though it crosses the line. Probably some are pleaded down. Uh, some are prosecuted, you know, people found guilty, not guilty. And, and the reason I'm going there is the perception, I guess. Um, you know, if, if there is less, uh, less thrown out at the beginning, less pleaded down, uh, I, I don't think it would take that many cases, uh, you know, if, if, you know, if a big deal is made of them somehow, uh, you know, to get the word out that uh, this isn't being tolerated. Um, I, I think it would go a long ways. But anyway, I would, I, I guess, I mean, if you do know, you may not know off the top of your head what is happening to these, to these cases, but um, I'm just interested. So thank you. Thank you, Representative. It's a good question. And Frankly, our office, it's very unusual that I, I, there's publicly known exceptions, but it's very unusual that our office investigate or, or investigates or considers charges for uh, charges like criminal threatening. Um, we generally are doing things like uh, homicides and sexual assault cases. Um, so I think that I don't have as broad based a perspective and I would throw your question if it's okay over to uh, State Attorney Tebow and Attorney Paul who may have a, a Bit of a better sort of broad-based perspective on what's happening around the state and the and the at the county level. Um, very quickly because it's uh, almost a noon hour and we give folks a break. Uh, so Rory, go ahead. Thank you. So we do see in any given year any number of uh, criminal threatening convictions or disturbing the peace by electronic means convictions. Uh, many of the lower ones go to diversion. Uh, we often try to do a community or restorative approach with the community justice center, although some offenders refuse to engage in that process because uh, while they may realize legal liability, they still don't have the sort of moral clarity or accountability that uh, we hope for from an outcome. I have also seen in many cases criminal threatening as a pled down offense from let's say ag assault with a threatening with a weapon or something like that. We're, we're covering the same area, but it's sort of a relief valve for a misdemeanor conviction as opposed to a felony. So they certainly do occur. Uh, at the and within the county court systems. Okay, Martin, I know you have something quick and then we're gonna... Yeah, just really quick that uh, uh, both Marshall and Rory, they had a couple citations that put in the chat and I've asked Evan uh, to put those onto our website. So, so they'll be available for, for, for everybody. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I, I have two actually, because I can't figure out how to do it. So. Um, okay, I'm going to stop us here. I really want to thank everybody, um, committee members, witnesses. I think this has been a really uh, helpful discussion. Uh, I think there are a number of ways we could, uh, places we could go from here. So let's keep keep thinking about it. Um, but I do do appreciate it. So, okay, so let's adjourn and. Uh, Thank you.